Hadian, a Muazin calls the faithful to prayers. Five times a day in mosques around the world, this call is repeated. To the God who has created the heavens and the earth. To the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, the God of Krishna, and the God of Muhammad. God is great. God is great. There is none worthy of worship except him. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. God is great. And there is none worthy of worship except he. In the last hundred years, Islam Ahmadiyat has been one of the fastest growing communities in the world. A worldwide movement founded simply on faith and submission to the will of God. A community so simple, yet so highly organized to meet the demands and challenges of the ever-changing world. A community believing in absolute morality, in joining justice and fairness in every sphere of human interest. For many, much of the history of Ahmadiyyat has been veiled behind fear and misconceptions. As a result, its followers were subjected to extreme persecution and deprived of fundamental human rights. Yet, Ahmadiyyat's core teachings are interwoven with the teachings of the Quran and the Holy Prophet of Islam. It was Ahmadis who highlighted the flaws in the events of the crucifixion of Jesus, even before the realization by modern scholars. It was they who were first to translate the Quran in more than 50 languages, from serving humanity to projecting the message of peace. Continents across the world have been united under its banner. But all this began with the life of a single ordinary man and the divine message he proclaimed. His name was Khulam Ahmed. Islam. Ahmadiyat, Islam, 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 Ahmadiyat. The society in which man existed was at its lowest ebb, and the final religion of mankind chosen by God, Islam, was rapidly degenerating. The holy prophet of Islam, peace and blessing of Allah be on him, prophesied that in the latter days, Muslims would suffer a terrible decline of standards. For if man is unable to control his desires, it is inevitable that the society would also suffer. The moral state of man was rapidly and dangerously declining. The Holy Prophet ﷺ mentioned by way of prophecy that uh, one thing, that in th that age the real faith will not be found among the Muslims. He mentioned that uh, they are scholars, will not be really leading the people to guidance. Their places of worship will be very well attended, but without any guidance. And uh, the faith would go, he has mentioned in so many words, that to up to the Pleiades. And it will not be seen on the surface of the earth. When at a time of problem, they will turn to the ulama and faiza whom so they will find them as uh, apes and swines. They will not be 
uh, divines. They will not be God-fearing ulama. It indicates that the scholars at that time, they will be similarly, similarly uh, you know, their character will be simply a character of mockery. They would not be representing the right faith. They will be imitating uh, to be scholars and moreover their moral uh, character and conduct will not be uh, you know, up to the mark or up to the standards of Islam at all. You know, this is what you see in the mosques. You see this very uh, mosque of other Muslims, other communities, full of people, but they have no understanding of the Quran or they don't have uh, taqwa in their heart. Now, when he came to this point, he showed a positive side, and the positive side was that when you see these things, this will be the time, this will be the time that uh, that reform and that Masih, that Mahdi would be raised, and he would come to reform, to make the Qur'an, the teaching of the Qur'an understood more and properly and correctly. History shows that when great mischief and evil takes over the world, God the Most Gracious has always sent his prophets to dispel the darkness and save mankind from moral self-destruction. The followers of Islam, in spite of their degradation, a time will come when God Almighty will raise someone to help the people to right, come to the right path. And that will be the period of the revival of Islam. At every age, whenever there was a um, downfall in any people, God always sent a reformer. So this, I mean, this is a continuous um, Allah's uh, treatment to people of every age. The salvation of mankind rested solely on divine intervention. If ever there was a need for a prophet for spiritual guidance and uplift, it was now. It was not only Islam that spoke of its own temporary decline. The other great religions of the world also spoke of a similar fate for themselves. They too were anxiously awaiting the advent of a promised reformer as predicted in their holy scriptures. The Jews expected that the Messiah would rejuvenate Judaism. The Christians claimed that the second advent of Jesus would bring nigh kingdom of heaven. The Muslims believed that the Messiah and Mahdi would join forces to bring about the final renaissance of Islam and its victory over all other religions. The Hindus awaited the coming of God in the form of Krishna, and the Buddhists were awaiting the reincarnation of Buddha. But this raises the question, how could God send different reformers at the same time, each calling to the same God in his own way? How could God invite mankind to divergent paths and conflicting ideologies? All uh, faiths, including uh, Islam and Christianity, claim that uh, a prophet will come in the latter days, whether he's Messiah or Mahdi or another Krishna. But logically speaking, if God sent all these people in these latter days, there'd be so much conflict. Will they bring the same law? Will they bring the same message? But if their messages aren't the same, that'll create disorder on the earth, so he can only bring one message. 